Welcome. Everything is great. You're listening to Fork and Bullshit, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 1 and 2, Everything is Great. Part 1 was written by Jen Statsky. She last wrote Season 1, Episode 9, Someone Like Me as a Member. And Part 2 is written by Joe Mandy, who last wrote Season 1, Episode 4, Jason Mendoza. Both episodes were directed by Trent O'Donnell. He last directed Season 1, Episode 7, The Eternal Shriek. And these episodes aired September 20th, 2017. So, we're on season two! Yeah, it's exciting. We get to watch the show episode by episode rather than all at once after it aired. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit different this time, so our podcast is going to be a little bit different as well. Obviously, we aren't going to have a spoiler zone because... Yeah, we know as much as you guys do. Exactly! So, we're going to be speculating right along with you, and and hopefully we can give you some fun insights as well. Mm -hmm. So, initial thoughts? Um... You look like you feel the same way I do. (laughs) Well, okay. Let's just say I really did like the episode. It was very funny. I was quite surprised that it wrapped up so quickly and that we reset again Mm -hmm. at the end of the episode. I actually thought it might take like two or three, but I did assume that it was going to happen early on in the season. I'm actually really happy that they didn't drag it on, though. I'm super glad. I think that would have been frustrating because we already know. There's no twist there coming for us as viewers. Right. So it would just have been this episode, but extended, right? So it took them two. I was, I was, you know, pretty close. Honestly, though, it still kind of felt like one with all the repeated elements. And yeah, I wasn't a huge fan. No. Of, okay. I liked the episode. I thought it was great. I enjoyed seeing everybody waking up for the second time. Michael wandering them around, holding their hand, telling them about what the good place is going to be like, who their soulmates are, etc. That was great. But we had so many overlapping scenes. Mm-hmm. It got extremely tedious. Like we saw the same scenes two, three, sometimes even four times. Yeah, just so that everything would connect as though we haven't already been watching it. Right, which no, you yeah. don't do that. No, I think they did it for flow reasons, which makes sense, but does get a little bit frustrating when you rewatch Eleanor approaching Chidi for the third time, you're sort of like, yeah, no, don't worry, guys. I remember. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was here. It was five minutes ago. Yeah, I, I get it. Thank you. I did check Twitter and Reddit, though, and the response seemed very positive. Yeah. It still was a really fun episode. It was hilarious to see all the new situations that Michael put them in. And it's great I- to see the characters again. Yes. And I like that we started off and just kind of gave us what people expected this entire season to be, but we crammed it into two episodes. Right. Like a one hour long season premiere. So that way we're not we're not messing with this for the rest of the season. We're not going to keep doing this over and over again because that's boring. Mm -hmm. And I expect better from this show. I really feel like it's going to keep surprising me. And now that the reset has already happened, I'm sort of like, where do we go now? Mm hmm. It's Jason, where do we go from here? <laughs> Just for context for you guys, that's like Jason's least favorite thing for people to say in movies and TV. And music and songs and anything ever. So how do you feel about the Buffy song? Where do we go from here? You know what I think. <laughs> you hate it. Okay, I get it. <laughs> All right. I did like that they gave us this cool, interesting new dynamic because it felt sort of like seeing the backstage of a play, Mm -hmm. which was cool. It was fun to see Michael dealing with the different demons and the reactions of the demons as well because they don't really seem happy about it. No, they don't seem happy at all. So it's like Michael is the only one holding this together and he's barely doing that. So the first season for me, we were over the shoulder of Eleanor the whole time. Mm -hmm. And now this first episode, it feels like we are over the shoulder of Michael. We're observing Michael's perspective instead of Eleanor's. So I find that very interesting because we know exactly what's behind the scenes, like you said. Like after the finale of season one, when rewatching it, it completely changes your perspective. So season two, we're still on that altered perspective of we know this is a big lie. So this show has to take us somewhere new. Yes, exactly. They can't sustain this. Do you feel like this episode's kind of a waste because Michael resets at the end? 
I don't think the episode's a waste. I think it's important to show the characters doing exactly what we want them to do. We want them to figure it out. So the show's like, hey, we're going to let them figure it out. But then we're going to pull the rug out from under your feet at the very end of the episode. So it was important to let the viewers know, to give the viewers what they want, and then say, we're doing something different. Yeah. I think it was important because the cliffhanger at the end of season one was, what is Eleanor going to do when she gets that note? Mm -hmm. Here's our answer. This is exactly what happens. She found that bowl of soup. Yeah. And now we're going to move into a different direction. So so I'm very excited to see... She found that bowl of soup. Oh my goodness. (laughs) That was such a good joke. I love that. I'm really excited to see where episode three comes in Mm -hmm. because I feel like possibly, maybe, hopefully at that point, we're going to kind of get a good idea of where the show might possibly maybe be going this season. I like how certain you are about that. I'm channeling my inner cheaty. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Which is so not you. (laughs) Uh, Okay. I'd say the same thing. I don't think it's a waste. Uh, I think it was a fun episode. I think it sets us up for new and interesting things this season. All right. So let's get into all that then. Sure. Michael meets with the demons to prepare for the welcome party and remind them of their goal. Eleanor searches for Chidi, but Michael interrupts her search to tell her she'll be giving a speech at the party. It's there that she finally finds Chidi. Michael offhandedly just saying, oh, you'll talk for, I don't know, like an hour. No, and thank like, you. Eleanor's face just, <laughs> I thought maybe you'd say like five, ten minutes, give a good rousing speech, just something quick. Nope. An, an hour. hour? What are you going to talk about for an hour? I'm better than everybody here. End of speech. Mic drop. Let me tell you why. <laughs> the many reasons. <laughs> oh, that best person sash was one of my favorite things from this episode. And I love it because that sash actually means that she gets a lot of attention at the welcome party, unlike last time where she was fairly invisible because she was just there with Chidi, Mm -hmm. right? She could fly under the radar, kind of meet everybody else, but now this time it's everybody coming to her, which is probably really annoying for her, right? So much worse. Yeah. Because she's in the spotlight as a fraud. But she should like that everyone's offering her drinks. Mm -hmm. She isn't happy about that, though. Yeah, we can... We'll talk about that a little bit later. For sure. But I really like that sash because it prevents her from blending in, and then that's just another form of torture. Mm -hmm. Plus, it looks so good on Kristen Bell, (laughs) you know? I mean, she should probably wear that sash all the time. Yeah, definitely. I, I hope that she took that sash home and she... Just wears it around the house. And her kids, mom, stop wearing the sash. Can't take it off if it's true. Oh. (laughs) And she just looks at her husband, Dax, and she's like, yeah, best person in this house. (laughs) Not best wife, not best woman, best person overall. Yeah. So one of the first lines when Michael's talking to Sean in his sweet teleconferencing device, Sean says, this project is due to fail. That whole sentence, this project is due slash doomed to fail, to me is, it's inevitable because Michael, Sean, everybody underestimates people, humans. They're going to figure out everything. They're going to band together. They're going to, their heart will overcome the the horrible, most awful torture ever. Wow, you sound really moved by that, like emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all sarcastic. No, but it's it seems true because of what we've seen happen in the first season and yes. even the events that happened in this first episode. Mm-hmm. Everybody grows, everybody changes. We discussed this in our first season of Fork and Bullshit, how Michael constantly underestimates humans and Eleanor and Chidi. Mm-hmm. He thinks they won't figure it out. He thinks he's pulling a fast one on all of them. And the quote unquote almost dumbest of the group figures it out. Mm-hmm. Well, he the gets dumbest it. actually kind of does. Yeah, he gets it in his, like, his own in the simplest way. terms. But yeah. yeah, it's a prank show. Right. <laughs> that we've already it, been on. Yeah, he even gets it the second time around. Mm-hmm. So Michael is always going to fail. Okay. No matter what he tries to do, no matter how often he tries to split them up, they're going to find each other. The season might actually dive into him realizing that and wanting to escape the eternal shriek. That's very possible. Yeah, that's definitely one of the theories out there. Michael welcomes Chidi to the good place and introduces him to two possible soulmates. Chidi instantly bonds with Angelique, but Michael swoops in to tell him his true soulmate is Pavita. At the welcome party, Chidi meets Eleanor and she shows him the note. 
He says he cannot help her. Doesn't mean anything to him. Mm -hmm. And he's got his own problems to deal with. It sounds like a you problem, Eleanor. <laughs> oh, I wish they had put that in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Chidi's part. Ooh, this is what should have happened. Eleanor shows him the note and Chidi says, doesn't look like anything to me. <gasps> and they're all robots and it's a Westworld amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers for Westworld? Crossover? <laughs> So we have lots of cheaty thoughts, I'm assuming. Yes, definitely. So Michael makes this whole joke about torturing philosophers. And I mean, it's cute at first glance, but after the third watch, it's not a great way to torture philosophers. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, Yeah, I don't either. I, I guess the joke is that they love school, they're academics. And they're naked. But yeah, that's a common like dream nightmare type scenario, right? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem to actually apply that well to philosophers. Right. I would think a more fitting torture could be like, they constantly have to have conversations with people who mistake them for a different philosopher or keep getting their philosophies mixed up and they have to continuously correct somebody or mm -hmm. somebody, I don't know. Yeah, or annoying things like, uh, a certain term is always on the tip of their tongue, but they can't remember it. Or they have to watch an argument between two philosophers and they can't step in at Ooh, all. Oh, yeah, that would, you know, that would be terrible. Something, something like that. Something that's a little bit more related to philosophy and not just, hey, these guys are academics. So what would be funny is that they show up to class naked for a test that they haven't studied for. Ooh, we're really getting them there. Maybe that's just how uncreative the bad place is at coming up with torturing. Mm. I mean, they have the penis flattener, they have the butthole spiders. They have. But the those are new, and they're enormous. <laughs> yep. The, the twisting department, I mean, the fire department. It's not very... Yeah. Michael's supposed to be the most creative, mm -hmm. personalized torture. Much more psychological versus physical. Right, exactly. Torment. And then I couldn't help but think, like, wouldn't Chidi feel conflicted that all of his heroes are being tortured, but supposedly he's way better than all of them? That's that's great. I love that because that makes Chidi so confused with everything that he's believed in and who these people are that he's been following and writing about his whole life. Yeah. Now he's just like, wait, what? But, but he doesn't seem phased by it. And that's yeah, the part that bugs he me. He kind of just dismisses it. He's like, sort of oh, like, that sucks. Oh, well, I'm 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 sad that I can't actually have conversations with all of my heroes, but I guess I'm okay with it because I'm safe here in the good place, which was one of our major critiques of last season of everyone just being okay with the idea that millions and millions of people are being tortured mm -hmm. just because they didn't get a point score of over a million. Right. So maybe Michael should have just said, "Oh yeah, they're just in another special philosophers den Ooh, that would have been worse it would island have been like, of philosophers yeah like they're in a different neighborhood and you can't ever visit that neighborhood Ooh, yeah. that would be so frustrating if all of his heroes were all together and they were in the good place but he just couldn't access them oh that's so much worse mm -hmm. and you could see like flyers being dropped about like gatherings or parties or cheese and wine socializing things that he just wasn't invited to Ooh, they floated in from they the other yeah, neighborhood. Exactly. They just, like, and Michael's like, oh, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know how this got here. I don't here. know how these keep falling in here. Yeah, because it's not like they're connected. You definitely can't go there. <laughs> For sure. That would have been, been good. Michael does have a little laugh after he mentions how the philosophers are being tortured. Yeah, which is like a huge giveaway. <laughs> You're like, not come really on. being very subtle there, Michael. Not even a little bit. Subtlety is what he's lacking in this entire episode, really. Yeah. Once they get outside, I couldn't help but notice that this show looks like Easter all the time. <laughs> because there's all these pastel colors and there's flowers everywhere. It just looks like Easter all the time. And it kind of weirds me out a little bit. Perpetual Easter. Okay. Yeah. Perpetually Easter. Mm -hmm. It's perpetually spring. What if your favorite season is fall? I would hate this place. I'd be like, no, I want to wear bulky scarves and drink hot chocolate, and I want leaves to be changing. Thank you. I don't want tulips. Don't give me tulips. I'm sure the area around your personalized house would be whatever season you love. Oh. Or you could ask Michael to spruce it up a little bit. Be like, hey, on Wednesdays, can we have it be fall in the neighborhood downtown? 
Oh my gosh, wouldn't it be fun if you could go through all the seasons in one week? Yeah. That'd be cool. I would actually tolerate winter at that point. So I actually really like Michael's torture of Chidi, but I don't think it's that effective the way he did it. I think the concept was good, the execution was poor. So when Michael said that Chidi was matched with two people, I actually thought he was going to suggest polyamory, more than one partner. Okay. Which... I suppose, could be an option for someone that's matched up with more than one soulmate. But in this case, he just gives two options, right? And one is very clearly better than the other. Super obvious. Which I hate. I actually wish that both of them had been great because then it would cause him more conflict. So you're thinking the torture could be in the choice instead of Michael's thinking the torture is the result. Chidi being forced to live with Pavita for the rest of eternity. And seeing his actual soulmate, Angelique, well, actual, quote unquote, Angelique with dude-ski, bro-ski over there. Pedro? Yeah, Pedro. (laughs) Yeah, well, now that you say it like that, that sounds more torturous, I guess, because to be bonded forever with someone that you clearly have nothing in common with is torturous. Right. And to see that someone was just out of your reach... Yeah, okay, that's great. I guess I just wish Pavita was a little bit better. She's so... uh, There's nothing. She's She's, so... She's gray. She's neutral. She's blah. She's not even gray. She's beige. She's forgettable. Yeah, it's just... I don't know. I guess I figured if you're going to torture him over this choice, then actually make the choice difficult. Mm -hmm. The choice itself was not at all difficult. No. Which we see when Chidi is able to make it so quickly, right? Yeah. Yeah, now that I'm thinking a little bit more about it, I do like it better that the choice was so easy to make, but then that he would have to live with the fact that he couldn't be with the woman he feels he's destined to be with. Right. And that would create some great storylines for Angelique. Oh, for sure. Which is, of course, why Vicky is so jealous that she's not getting to play that role. Mm -hmm. And Pavita even already starts at the games. When Chidi wants to choose a wine, the red wine or the white wine, and she says, oh, in your heart of hearts, you know which one you want. Mm Mm-hmm. Subtle. Not even a little bit. (laughs) Ugh. Okay, yeah. They need more subtlety. Michael, this episode, is nowhere near the subtle train. Like, he completely missed the station. Oh, yeah. He doesn't even know there is a station. He Ubered his way right to, like, Super Directville. <laughs> Terrible. Past Subtle Town, entering Directville. <laughs> oh, shoot, I missed my stop. <laughs> oh, well, this will do fine. This is, this is good. There is a tiny little second of a clip where you get to see everybody's names. So we see the names of Chidi's potential soulmates and also Pedro. And I liked it because there were a couple of references in there that were nice. Um, But the best one was that Angelique's last name is Derrida, which is an obvious reference to Jacques Derrida, who's a famous French philosopher who's known for a form of analysis that he called deconstruction. We get the last name of Pedro and Pavita, but Pavita's last name doesn't seem to be a reference to anything. It's just an Indonesian last name. But Pedro's last name, Borges, I want to say. I'm probably not saying that right. Maybe a reference to Jorge Luis Borges, who is an Argentinian short story writer, essayist, and poet. Um, And he wrote short stories that had themes of dreams and labyrinths and philosophy. So I thought that was kind of cool because this version, take three, may be a really big labyrinth for them which I think could be very fun. And we also got a shout out to another philosopher that Chidi would love to have lunch with, uh, Michel Foucault, who's a famous French philosopher who primarily addressed the relationship between power and knowledge and how they're used as a form of social control through societal institutions. So he would encourage the world to think critically about modern institutions by looking back at their history. I just think that's, that's kind of a nice shout out because... This is what we're doing with the show. We're rethinking this whole institution of heaven and hell. Because we are seeing it. We're seeing hell playing like it's heaven, Mm -hmm. right? So now we can think a little bit more critically about the afterlife. Okay. Yeah. And I really doubt that Foucault would be tricked by Michael's plan. I think he would be (laughs) right onto it from the moment they begin. So the four of them, 
Chidi, Pedro, Angelique, and Pavita are having their their discussion in the pizza parlor. Mm-hmm. And I love watching Denise in the background. She rolls her eyes better than anyone ever in this show. Fantastic. <laughs> the um, the Hawaiian pizza topic because oh, it's it's amazing how much of the pizza is Hawaiian. I wonder what they serve in the bad place. Ha ha ha. But I love Hawaiian pizza. So you can go straight to hell. No. <laughs> Actually, you can, where yeah. you can enjoy a fresh slice of Hawaiian pizza. Exactly. <laughs> I have no thoughts on Hawaiian pizza because I you don't, eat, the don't ham. eat meat. Yeah, we get it. You're better than me. Whatever. Well, I mean, if you're going to say it, you should <laughs> give me a sash. <laughs> um, no, but I guess I just have no real feelings. I'm like, let people eat what they want to eat. I don't care. <laughs> I'm what very a, blase about it. A lot of the humor and great bits of this episode happen over someone's shoulder or in the background. Mm-hmm. So I really enjoyed watching the episode multiple times for those reactions. Yeah, I didn't actually notice that Vicky was there on my first time around. I didn't notice that she stayed in the scene after she gave them the pizza. Mm-hmm. But then just to watch her rolling her eyes, sighing, wishing she was in Angelique's position. Mm -hmm. Like, I can do so much better. Exactly. Watching and critiquing her performance. Like, ugh. Well, I would have said his name better. Or, oh, well, I would have touched Chidi's shoulder at this moment. Something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. I would have blown everybody away with my acting chops. Mm Mm-hmm. She's too much. Just like a Ferrari. Very demanding, right? Right. Needs special fuel. Sure. Buffs and washes. Scrubs. And shines. Slow driving. I don't waxes, know. <laughs> you know. Expensive repairs. Right. Vicky is all of those things. Yes. High maintenance. All right. Shall we move on? On to tahini. You know, like the sauce. Oh, my God. Michael welcomes Tahani to the good place. He introduces her to her new soulmate, a short doctor named Tomas. Michael shows Tahani her extremely cozy home, complete with a giant Camilla portrait. Tahani attends the welcome party wearing cargo pants, a jean jacket, and Crocs. She gets drunk, interrupts Eleanor's speech, and causes a fire. Tahani's story might be my favorite. Agreed. We've had so many episodes (laughs) in the past of season one about superior to Hani and how much better she is than anyone. It's great to see her super uncomfortable, completely cut down, Mm -hmm. and miserable. I agree. Like, she was miserable last time, but it was so subtle, Mm -hmm. right? But I really like that Eleanor and Tahani have switched places. Tahani really feels threatened by what she believes to be Eleanor's superiority, right? When she sees Eleanor wearing this best person sash and the little tiara on her. That really tips her over the edge. Yeah, she feels like, no, no, no. This girl over here, there's no way she's better than me. I mean, look at her. Last season, we had her agonizing over the neighborhood rankings. But now this season, it's we're moving that timeline up with Eleanor walking around looking like she's the best. Mm -hmm. We get to Hani, who feels really insecure. Everything that's happened to her just is another nail in that insecurity bubble. Mm -hmm. And I really love Michael's comment like, do you want to live on a private moon by yourself? Because we can make that happen. I mean, like, no request is too frivolous or Mm -hmm. everybody else is happy. So I have plenty of time to deal with your requests. Yeah, because apparently you are not happy. That whole conversation is probably my favorite bit of writing in this whole show. It's so passive aggressive. The it's way amazing. that Ted Danson delivers it. Oh, <laughs> it's so good. And Tahani's face. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it's it's really glorious. It really is. It's it's so good. Michael's comment earlier in um in that sequence when he shows them their their new tiny home, which looks like, what is it, a treehouse or something? It's just really small. <laughs> it's cozy. It's very cute. The walls are hugging me. But he mentions that, oh, of course, humanitarians wouldn't want something so extravagant. But if everything in the good place is a construct, which we can pretty much see as he just, like, waves away the second floor and the stairs, then what does it matter? Because it's not like the environment is affected, and it's not as though others in the good place can't have those things as well. 
Because... There is no class here. Right. So if I was Tahani, I guess I would be thinking like, well, can I have anything? Isn't that the point? If you can just wave away the second floor, can you not just wave away this whole little treehouse thing you've made me and give me a mansion just easily with the flick of your hand? But you know exactly why. Oh, yeah. Of course. Because she's not supposed to want anything, which is obviously part of the fun. Mm Mm-hmm. So, oh, it is. But if you were Tahani, you might start to think, like, something's off a little bit. Yes. And I think I but think that she, is a big hint for that's, her. That's another thing. Because as soon as she starts thinking that, does she think, oh, maybe I'm just being too selfish. Or maybe I shouldn't be even thinking this. So it's kind of genius. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. Because he gets her to doubt herself right away. Yeah. When she is asking for a bigger home, and he says, you know, the comment about the moon... <laughs> she immediately is like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I'm, fine, I'm okay. Yeah. She just backtracks like, oh, I'm being selfish now. Exactly. Making herself feel worse. And as hilarious as it is that Tahani is dressed in cargo pants and jean jacket and the, the Crocs, it's also an indication that she's making an effort to click with her supposed soulmate. Because in her real life, Tahani was always trying to appeal to other people, right? She was trying to be who she thought they wanted her to be. And we see that she continues this behavior even now. So to me, it seems like she's way more insecure in this version, which I like. I like insecure Tahani right off the bat. Mm -hmm. We're not getting this confident model type that we got last season. Well, there was definitely a progression of her confidence throughout this episode Mm -hmm. we started at the top when she's in michael's office and she says oh what a surprise i mean i accept of course (laughs) which obviously i made it to the good place hello i'm tahani el jamil duh so where's my beth person sash yeah let's go (laughs) so she goes from there and then she starts going downhill meeting the doctor and i mean he's fine he's just a little short no big deal where'd you go to medical short oops (laughs) <laughs> just a Freudian short, my bad. <laughs> and then it just keeps getting progressively worse. And they do it so quickly. Yes. Like her her section is not all that long, but we really get the sense that this is a very steep decline yeah. in one episode, which is pretty great. Yeah. They do well. I also like that we get a shout out to Canada when Glenn comes over I'm and he Winnipeg? says, I was a garbage man in Winnipeg. I was like, hey, that's in Canada. Cool. I'm excited. (laughs) (laughs) Anytime Canada's referenced on a show. Ooh. Basically. (laughs) That's where I live. Yeah. Michael welcomes Jason to the neighborhood and introduces him to his platonic soulmate, Wong, another silent monk. Jason is frustrated by his soulmate, so he tries and fails to ditch him. At the welcome party, Michael is distracted by Vicky's complaints. Jason attends the welcome party with Long, but runs away as soon as his soulmate is distracted. I really love the inclusion of Luong. How okay. come? Because it introduces the idea that soulmates don't have to be romantic. Right. Which I think is great. It's so fun. Michael actually says every resident has a soulmate. Some are platonic, some are romantic. And then he goes on to say that Jason's soulmate is a little bit different from anybody else's, right? Very unique because they're like binary souls but i really like that idea that you don't have to have a romantic soulmate Mm -hmm. there are some people out there who do not prioritize romance at all Mm -hmm. they aren't even interested in it so would they be soulmateless i guess in this idea of the good place they wouldn't be which is nice this doesn't prove anything obviously but it's just saying that everybody can have someone special like that Yeah, it doesn't have to be romantic. It doesn't have to be sexual in any way. It can just be platonic, Mm -hmm. which I think is fun. Jason's silence gives Manny Jacinto the opportunity to make some truly excellent facial expressions. When Michael is explaining the relationship to Jason, saying, you know, you're two binary stars and all that, and Jason is obviously super confused, and his eyebrows do a furrow, and it's like his you can see his gears turning, like trying to figure out what the heck Michael's talking about. Mm-hmm. So Michael just has to straight out tell him, you're going to be like buds. Yeah. Best buds. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't say bros. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, him and his bud hole last season. Yeah, that's true. One of the jokes that didn't really work for me in this episode was the rock scene 
when Jason is arranging the rocks to spell boobs. Really? That didn't work for you? Like, it's funny, but when I thought a little bit more about it, it's too obvious. If this was too obvious, no, but it have was, you met Jason? Okay, yes. But if this was actually the good place, right? Which he believes that it is. Yep. If it was actually the good place, and this was truly his soulmate. His soulmate would be suspicious. Yes. Be like, why are you spelling out boobs? Exactly. You're a monk. That's very suspicious behavior. You're blowing your cover. Like, it's funny. I see what you're saying. But it's no, I totally get it. kind of breaks a little bit of my understanding of what Jason is supposed to be doing here. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll just quickly mention something that I believe I caught in the background of the party scene. The music that's playing, it's very quiet in every scene that is revolving around the party, mm-hmm. except for the moment when Jason is actually drinking the, the axe milk with Luang. Uh, you can hear it a bit more clearly. It's classical music, and I believe it's from Mozart's symphony or opera, uh, The Magic Flute. And that piece is entitled Papagena and Papageno, I believe, which is about two bird people who are soulmates, basically. Hmm. And he had lost his, his Papagena, and he finds her, and they're happy together as soulmates. So I thought it was kind of fitting music to be playing. When all of these people are supposed to be with their soulmates? Yeah, I Mm -hmm. thought it was kind of funny. Okay, cool. And I I hope I'm right, because that just makes it better. It's nice to know if they think of that kind of stuff, Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, we should have some music playing in the background. What What should it be? Well, something classical, because it's a fancy house. Okay, but what? Ooh, soulmate talk. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Shall we continue? Let's continue. Chidi agrees to help Eleanor. Michael has a meeting with the demons to try and salvage the evening. Jason calls for Janet and confesses everything to her. She says she can help him with his loneliness. Everyone gathers at Eleanor's house, and suddenly Michael's plan is thwarted again. And we begin anew. Take three. Oh, goodness. This is like the season finale plot twist of season one in the first episode. Exactly. Hey, we're going to do it again. What a (laughs) twist. It was actually kind of a twist. A lot of people weren't expecting it that early. I wasn't expecting it that early. I thought they'd go, like you said, two or three, maybe three or four episodes. Yeah, we did technically get two episodes out of it. It's basically one extended episode, but... The question was, how long until Eleanor figures this whole thing out again, and how long is it going to take? Not long. Not long at all, (laughs) yeah. Literally one day. That's pretty bad, Michael. (laughs) So Chidi and Eleanor's decision to work together, of course, makes my heart very happy. Mm -hmm. And Eleanor's flirting with Chidi is really cute, too. Eleanor is not flirting with Chidi. Eleanor thinks that Chidi's flirting with her. Uh, I think she's flirting with Chidi because she's assuming that everything he's saying is flirtatious. When she's like, hey, is that some kind of nerd pickup line? Because it's only kind of working. (laughs) And I'm not not interested, but we do have other things to do. She's thinking thoughts is all I'm saying. Yep. Just like she okay. was last season. Okay. Except it took her a lot longer last season, whereas it seems like pretty much right away she's just into it. Which I like. Go for it. Did you find it weird that Chidi refused to help her? Nope. Not even slightly. Really? Because he doesn't know who she is. She's a stranger. She's being weird. Yeah, but he's she has got... a note. Yeah, but he's got other things on his mind. But don't you think that he would wonder... Like, what's up with the note right away? I definitely would. I'd be like, how does she even know me? Not really, because the situation that Eleanor just pulled him out of was him talking with Angelique. Right, who he he, believes is his soulmate. Right, so he's concerned about that situation and this crazy lady with a note with his name on it. He doesn't want to deal with that right now. Okay. Because like he said, it literally means nothing to me. Mm. So I'm going to go deal with my problems. You can figure your stuff out. Right. And I think it's because part of it is because that she's already like five steps ahead of him. Right. She's realized that everyone's acting weird around her. He hasn't realized that yet. And also she's talking about this potentially magical bracelet. So he might just think, well, she's kind of just off. She's bonkers. There's something wrong with her. Okay. At first I thought, well, geez, Chidi would want to help her, right? Wouldn't he want to know? So it came off a little bit inconsistent. For me, but you have a good point. 
he's focused on other things, and he does come to her, like, a few seconds later when he realizes, hey, maybe this place isn't so great when Tahani does her big drunken speech and sets the place on fire. Mm -hmm. Something's off here, and yeah. maybe she knows a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm. And we have Eleanor confiding in Chidi first, and Jason confiding in Janet first, just like last time. Did Jason confide in Janet? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because she got him all the stuff from his butthole. Exactly. So she knew that there was something different about him. Right. I like it. We're getting our couples back again. The consistency. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We get them back together again, and then Michael's going to tear them apart once more. Mm, I'm nervous about the next episode. I don't not know what's going to happen. I have complete faith in this show. Well, not nervous in the sense that I think it's going to bomb. I'm just nervous because I care about these characters and I want them to be happy. Yeah, of course. <laughs> You want them to be happy. But in the this primary place. thing about the show is that they're being tortured. Yeah. Which is just torture for me. Oh, meta. Whoa. You just Whoa. blew my mind. <gasps> the real Michael is Michael Schur. Oh. Torturing all of us. Oh, boy. Okay, pack it in, boys. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we, we just, are done. Yeah, we figured out the whole show. <laughs> I love Janet and Jason's first meeting. When he sees her pop up for the first time, his expression is fantastic. Like, Manny Jacinto does such a great job because he doesn't just look surprised. He actually looks like he recognizes her a little bit hmm. and almost like he longs for her or has some sort of affection. It's just there's a lot under there, right? My Janet, come to me. <laughs> exactly. My Janet, come to me. But then he calls for her and... He wants to go hang out with her. Like, that's so sweet. The idea that he just wants to go to her house instead. And she has to say, no, I live in a boundless void, which is a great fact. Love it. Tells us a little bit more about what the heck Janet is up to when she's not around. She's apparently surrounded by literal nothingness, mm -hmm. which is cool. But then I'm a little bit confused because Janet says... Oh, I can take you somewhere. I, I know exactly who you can talk to. And then she brings him to Eleanor. I had thoughts about that because I liked that line. And I thought, well, why the heck does she bring Jason to Eleanor? Mm -hmm. And my thought process is Janet knows everything. Right. She knows that Eleanor doesn't belong there. She just found out that Jason doesn't belong there. Maybe those two can have something to talk about. Wouldn't she already know prior to Jason telling her that he doesn't belong there? Yes. Do you think but that she has no reason to say anything about it? She's not going to bring it up. It's just part of her knowledge. Okay. She has the directory of everybody in the good place, right. quote unquote. So she knows everybody's details. I guess, but it didn't seem like she knew that Eleanor didn't belong there last time. So why would she know this time? Why does he, why do you say that? Well, in the first season, mm -hmm. she's able to answer Eleanor's questions. Yep. She doesn't seem to indicate anything about knowing that she doesn't belong there. Why would she? There's literally no reason for her to act any differently unless somebody specifically would say, Hey, Janet, does Eleanor belong here? Or, Hey, Janet, is there anybody in the good place that does not belong here? Which mm. nobody would ever ask because of the whole experiment. And she wouldn't alert Michael to it. But then that... Makes me wonder, does Janet know that this isn't actually the good place? Does she know that it's the bad place? I don't think she does. I think that Michael tinkered with her programming that much, so she's unaware. Hmm. Because in the season finale of season one, when Eleanor says this is the bad place and Michael does his laugh, Janet doesn't really react, but she doesn't not react. Yeah, but... Janet's also an AI. She doesn't really have large reactions mm -hmm. to things. I know. She does say to Jason that she cannot visit him in the bad place. It is literally impossible because, well, they're currently in the bad place. But I always had the impression that she didn't know that Eleanor didn't belong there. Okay. Maybe I, that's not everybody's impression. Maybe everybody assumed that Well, that's Janet the reason. Knew. Like, I was trying to figure out why Janet would bring Jason there. And that's the only explanation i can come up with yeah so if there's a better one i hope i hear it otherwise i'm right and you're wrong okay <laughs> <laughs> we're just going with black and white right and wrong mm -hmm. is that right okay so the part that we can criticize in this episode is eleanor's decision to show michael the note what was that about i mean 
Of course, the episode has to go there. Michael has to find the note. But I would have rather Eleanor let it drop out of her pocket versus her just saying, hey, I wrote this note. What do you think he's going to do if you've already been here and you don't remember it? Uh, you think Michael maybe had something to do with that? Do you, you think, think maybe do showing him the note is a terrible idea? And then she acts so surprised, like, oh, he's going to do it again, tries to shove it into her mouth, which, hello, there's a reason you didn't do that last time. Yeah, just Eleanor panics at the last moment mm-hmm. and forks them all over. Not great. Not a great moment for her. Her life is literally full of those moments. Of her panicking? Of her forking things up. Oh, yeah, definitely. I do like that she notices that the Bad Place actors were clearly all coached to say the same thing and in the same way. That was perfect. I didn't notice it the first time I was watching because I think I was just focused on the fact that, oh, my goodness, everything is crumbling. But when she notices that Tomas says the exact same thing as Pavita and in the exact same way, the there you are, I've been worried sick about you. I love that. It's so good. And then Eleanor's soulmate comes in and says she just that, calls him right out yeah, on it. Oh, like, let me guess. Oh, you've been worried sick about me. And he just immediately takes off a shirt. I'm heading to the gym, which is a great little gag. Um, mm-hmm. I do wonder if he's going to be in the next episode. If he is, if he's in a new role or if he stays her soulmate, because I think Michael's going to not keep him around as her soulmate. He's I think that would dumb. be a bad move. Yeah. yeah. The climax of the episode, this whole everybody meeting in Eleanor's house and all shuffling in after one after another is, I think, one of my favorite finales of one of the Good Place episodes. Like, it all just comes together so fluidly. Everybody meeting there and piling in and mistake after mistake. And you can just see Michael getting exasperated. Like, oh, of course. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Of course, Janet knows Jason's real name. And of course, these morons are going to come piling in and screw up their lines and of course Eleanor is gonna call him out on it and of course Tahani's gonna say something's off like he's just every time he's like oh mm mm-hmm yep great oh yeah that's another thing great awesome yep this is going (laughs) splendidly (laughs) super duper everything is great yeah awesome so that's part of my I think that's my favorite moment in one of the episodes like just how it all comes together. And Michael's reaction to this swirling mess of events. Yeah, just incredulous. Yeah. Like, hands up in the air. I gave I up. I gave it. Yep. It's just whatever. At if, this if point. If they can't figure it out, I'm just going to spill it because I'm just frustrated. Yeah, seriously. You can you can see it on his face. Like, there's no way to bring them back from this No, moment. he's even smiling and, like, kind of laughing. Like, this is just ridiculous. Yep. This is the absolute worst. His line at the party, what the fork is going on? Like, he even says it. Oh, yeah. He's very confused. He doesn't understand at all why this all blew up in his face so quickly. But, Michael, this is your fault. Like, Mm -hmm. you lacked subtlety in this episode. Like, you were way too obvious. And that's why this all fell apart. It's not the note. It's not solely the note, anyway. Because if everybody's life had appeared perfect... Eleanor wouldn't care about the note. No. If her soulmate was actually, like, attentive and kind to her and loving instead of ignoring her every second. Like, ditching off to the gym every five minutes. Yeah, with the same excuse. Dude, come on. Um, (laughs) Then she wouldn't really feel the rush to find Mm Chidi. And even if Eleanor did, but she was the only one who felt that way then this wouldn't have all fallen apart so quickly. If Chidi was in a perfect situation, if Tahani was in a perfect situation, and Jason as well, like, you wouldn't have all four of them saying, something's up. Yeah, Michael tried too hard. Oh, way too hard. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe he'll learn for round three. I hope so. Me too. I'm very excited to see what they come up with, and uh, definitely excited for the next episode. So we sort of mentioned earlier Michael's plan, and wondering what the long-term goal is here. And I was thinking about that the third time I watched this episode. Because I was thinking, okay, that's a lot of demons working to torture four people. So eventually, what's he thinking? Is the ratio going to go down significantly? And you're going to have maybe 20 demons in the entire neighborhood? And have 300 humans? And the other demons torturing them? It just seems like a lot of people doing work. Like, a lot of demons, anyway, working to torture a very small amount of humans. 
or eventually will the neighborhood grow and you have eight humans and the same amount of demons and or you know like 50 humans all torturing each other and you know a, a bustling utopia of of demons yeah he says that there's a better way to torture people than just physical torment but this plan seems sort of unsustainable yeah just because of the sheer amount of demons that you need to have right it's like he's beta testing an idea Mm -hmm. just like a proof of concept okay it can work we can tweak it after i prove that it works once you give me the go-ahead yeah but like here's the basic idea they torture each other Mm -hmm. yeah so jason what are you looking forward to seeing in the next episode i'm looking forward to being surprised again yeah me too 21 minute episode nice and quick Mm-hmm. No overlapping scenes. It makes me a little sad that every episode isn't an hour long. I know. It'd I, be a great yeah. like hour-long drama. Oh, for sure. Even if it was just an hour-long comedy, just keep it as it is, but make it longer. <laughs> Give me more. <laughs> Give me more good place. Yeah. I'm excited to see who ends up being the soulmates for everybody. I wonder if they're going to keep all of the same ones, but just tweak their relationships. Maybe Michael will cave and give Denise back her old job. Or... Give Vicky back her old job. Yeah. I Maybe he's going to train Eleanor's soulmate on different excuses. Or make him not give excuses, but just be very unhelpful to Eleanor. Uh, maybe he's going to keep Tahani's soulmate the same guy. It's still going to be Tomas, but Tomas dresses really well this time. And they have a big fancy house. So she can overlook the fact that he's short. Mm, make kind him of or- overlook it. Okay. Well, yeah. obviously she can overlook him. Oh, wow. She's taller. Because <laughs> oh, he's short. No, 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 yeah. no, no. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very interested to see that and just to figure out sort of where they're heading this season. Because it feels like we got season one and then almost as though we had all of season two in one episode mm-hmm. or one two-part episode. And now we're going to have season three. It's kind of how it feels. So I'm excited to see where it goes. For yeah, sure. So do you want to talk a little bit about how the characters have changed this episode. Absolutely. We got a request from Joss at Joss Ruckus on Twitter, who said that she wanted to hear about the differences that we see in the characters. So clearly other people are noticing it too. Like there's there's something different about our core four. Yes. Right? It definitely is. So what I'm wondering is, are the characters fundamentally changed by their experience in version one, or is it just the circumstances of version two that created this change in them because Eleanor she abstains from drinking she refuses to make a fool of herself at the welcome party she chats with strangers although awkwardly and she's already kind of critical of her past self like she makes this joke about getting drunk at her not niece's christening which is funny but also shows that she's aware that that was a bad choice Mm -hmm. she just seems different and she really seems like she's more responsible 100 Mm percent. yeah absolutely i think eleanor has grown from her past experiences regardless of whether she remembers it or not yeah her memory is wiped but her instincts her learning has stuck so i think repeating something Mm -hmm. continuing something through repetition Mm -hmm. practicing being good whatever whether you realize it or not it's going to change you so okay eleanor i believe has been changed by season one eleanor Hmm. which actually works a lot with um, the theory that Aristotle posits that repetition, doing good actions, will eventually make you a good person. Right. Right? So learning through repetition, through action, and through models. Exactly. So everything she did in version one, even though she may not remember any of those particular instances, she might not remember letting Gunner go ahead of her in line at the yogurt shop. Mm Mm-hmm. She still feels a pull to do the right thing. Right. Okay. Cool. So the examples are obvious. Like Eleanor is not drinking. She remembers some names. She remembers Jessica's name when she's talking to her. She even uses it. Oh, I didn't uh, notice that. Because they were doing the joke of her not remembering Janet's name. Right, at the beginning. And she said to herself, like, why don't I ever listen to people when they talk about themselves? So that even though she ends that with, no, I'm right, people are dumb. But <laughs> she even, just the fact that she asked herself that 
she's regretting it a little bit because like she needs Janet. Right. So like, why don't I do this? She's being reflective. She is. Yeah. And it's out of character from what we've seen in the flashbacks from season one. Oh, so definitely. It it shows growth for sure. She was not the type to self-reflect on Earth. Mm -hmm. So this is already a big change. And what about Tahani? Do you find that she's changed? I feel like she's changed, but more so by the circumstances of version two. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned earlier, she seems much more insecure this time around because she's not the star of the of the neighborhood anymore. I also noticed that she's quicker to voice her frustration. Absolutely. So I don't see like a fundamental change in her as much as I do Eleanor and and Chidi. More circumstantial. What do you well, think? Well, that makes sense because we don't actually see Tahani do a whole lot of changing in season one. Yeah. I don't think she changes a whole lot. No, I think her and Jason are the ones that change the least. Mm -hmm. Tahani does speak her true feelings at the party. Yep. Even if she is drunk. Yep. Uh, and she does admit that her cargo pants are comfortable. Surprising yes. herself. Praising off the rack separates what's happened to me. Exactly. <laughs> And she even apologizes to Eleanor when yes. she hands her back her sash. Like, I'm sorry, I made a fool of myself. I don't deserve this. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's huge for her. Okay. And we can jump over to Jason, who does some changing of his own. He doesn't seem to be hiding like he was last season. Yeah, um, we mentioned that earlier on in this episode. Mm -hmm. in and, discussions. and he immediately goes to Janet for comfort. Sort of like he remembers a sort of familiarity between them anyway. And in that time of night, that was when he revealed to Eleanor who he was. Right. The same alleyway, yes. like the same cobblestone street and mm -hmm. the same time of night. But I don't see a huge change in him either. Like he's still Jason. Yes, very much so. He He's just not as... He never wanted to hide in season one. He just had to out of self-preservation. Yeah. So he's still silly. He's still dumb. I don't really see a big change. But I don't think he changed that much in season one. Mm -hmm. His love for Janet was the biggest character arc he went through. But I see a big change in Janet, actually. Mm -hmm. Janet seems way more expressive. Definitely. This season, which is exciting and has really fun and exciting implications for our conversations on her personhood, which mm -hmm. are going to continue this season. Of course. Like, I just think it's so great. She rightly interprets what Jason is longing for. She repeats. Yeah. She repeats what she feels like he said. Yeah. And checks sort of for confirmation. Like, okay, is, is that right? She gets it. She understands that he feels lonely, that he feels isolated. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like she understands emotions better. And she's also more open to affection. Like, when he hugs her, yes, she doesn't reciprocate that hug until... He says, well, you're my friend. And he then she hugs why. him back, yep. which never happened in season one. When he hugged her and said, oh, you're the only person that's nice to me, my friend. She was like, okay, and got up and left. There was no reciprocating that. that yeah, she did this all on affection. her own. She hugged yeah. him back on her own. Yeah. And when they come in later, she's holding his hand. She introduces him as Jason. Like there's something has been changed there for her. Mm -hmm. Janet's been adjusted. Yeah, definitely. She has learned and grown. So what version of Janet is this? Is this four? Uh, we had the first Janet before she got murdered mm -hmm. in season one. And then we had the next one. Um, so this is Janet three. Okay, Janet yeah. version three. Janet version three. And then by the end of the episode, we see Janet version four, which I think looks the most like a flight attendant because she's got the hair pulled back in that bun. So I kind of hope that they don't keep this version around that long only because you don't I, like her outfit i don't like her outfit and i don't like her hair okay. i don't think it's very flattering on darcy Carden, and she's such a beautiful woman that i'm just like oh man i want you to be in a lovely outfit where you feel pretty okay maybe she does feel pretty i don't know i didn't talk to her i didn't ask but personally i'm not a fan of the updo <laughs> so lastly and perhaps the most important for you in Chidi. people who changed. <laughs> Chidi. Yes. So I feel like Chidi has been changed fundamentally. I think he changed only a tiny bit. Okay. I see him as much more confident. 
And even though he tells Michael, like, yes, I'm uncomfortable with making choices, he makes it really quickly. Like, yes, it's an easy choice to make, but... He still makes it. Last season, he had a choice between Tahani Eleanor and, well, fake Eleanor and real Eleanor, right? And Tahani, who he didn't really have that big of a connection with and who wasn't supposed to be his soulmate in any way or wasn't mistaken to be a soulmate, was still an option for him, right? So I just see him as being more confident in his decisions this season. And then when he's proved wrong by Michael and told, no, Pavita is supposed to be your soulmate and that's that's the algorithm. Too bad. They got it right. He ends up telling Angelique that he actually feels like they're meant to be together, which to me seems very confident. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, you're going to say to this woman straight to her face, knowing that she's supposed to be someone else's soulmate. That you think she belongs with you? Right. Woo, okay. That is big. All right, Cheaty. So I think that's a pretty big move. And then he believes Eleanor pretty quickly. I think the circumstances are kind of helping in yeah, that regard. For sure. Yeah, I think mainly it's just his confidence level that I see has changed. Okay. So. He definitely has grown there and he does make some decisions fairly quickly. Mm hmm. He doesn't really get upset when Eleanor's calling him a nerd all the time, mm -hmm. which she says several times in this episode. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get insecure about it because I just feel like he's not as insecure. And when Michael says that he has to make this decision, he's like, okay, I don't like it. I know it's going to suck, but I'll do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still cheaty. It's still anxiety-ridden cheaty. We mm -hmm. still see him getting flustered and almost freaking out a little bit, but... But handling himself yeah, a little bit a better. a lot better than season one. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, so that's our breakdown of changes. Changes in the characters. Going through in the good place with changes. <laughs> it sounds like we're talking about puberty. Mm. Changes, body hair. Places that it wasn't there. <laughs> okay, since we recently talked about Janet, I'm going to bring up a question that one of our listeners had. Lexa sent us a message on Facebook to ask, how do you feel about Janet's ride or die protocol? And do you think it will affect things going forward? I hope that it wasn't just a throwaway line. Me too. Because ride or die, fast and furious, cars, you know, it's it's like, it's totally up Jason's alley for her to say something like that for Jason. Oh, right. Yeah, it is. So I hope it wasn't just a throwaway and that it's actually going to have some implications mm -hmm. because that's coded deep within Janet. And it probably, to be something like that, like a ride or die protocol, I believe wouldn't be able to be erased by Michael. That's I would something hope so. like hard coded into her system. Mm -hmm. Read only, can't write over that. Yeah. And I don't think that this ride or die protocol says, I love Jason, he is my husband, that kind of thing. But more like, help Jason, make Jason happy. So sort of making him a priority over others. Mm -hmm. And she says in that particular episode in season one, like, I can't go unless my husband instructs me to. I've initiated a ride or die protocol. Um, so it seems like it's not really relationship wise. It's more like she has a sense of duty to him. Right. Yeah. And I think we're already seeing the effects of it in this episode. She's looking after him already. Yeah, she's just different with him. And I'm excited to see if she remains different with other people or if it's kind of a Jason-only thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you for your question, Lexa. Yeah, that was a pretty baller question. Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about it. Yeah, I, I kind of forgot about it like i knew okay jason has to be a little bit different in this season and janet has to be a little bit different kind of forgot about that protocol yeah. <laughs> do you want to get to the other questions mad max mom asks uh did we ever find out how tahani died not episode specific but still a question nope we no haven't. we haven't no. found we know that she died we don't obviously. know obviously we don't know how i'm assuming it was camilla related Oh, goodness, maybe. Or Camilla made a profit on her death, made an art installation after she was, I don't know, hit by an uh, air conditioning delivery truck that ended up delivering the air conditioner that crushed GD or something. You just want them to be together, don't you? Still. No. Oh, okay. I just, I just think it would be great to have Camilla profit over Tahani's death. Oh, well, yeah. 
I guess. It would be fitting for Tahani just another thing that Camilla did better. Mm -hmm. Well, she does say in season one, episode 11, she says to Eleanor, well, it's not as though you could sacrifice your life to save others or change the consciousness of a nation, both of which I did, by the way. Such fun. But knowing Tahani, it's not like she would have thrown herself in front of a bullet for somebody else or something equally dramatic. I imagine that she truly believes that she saved others by Mm. sacrificing her life, but I don't think it's going to be something dramatic. It's going to be, she blew it way out of proportion. I really wonder if we're going to see it this season. I hope that we are. I wonder if we're going to see any flashbacks. We didn't get any in this episode, because of course we already know what they're like. We flashed back to the episode that we were watching Uh, several times. That's true. But we didn't get any Lost style flashbacks. No, we did not. And I hope we'll keep those up for this season. It would be fun to see. And a listener, Max, didn't have a question or a theory just yet. But he said he had lots and lots of glee about this episode. Oh, glee. Glee. Did you know that glee literally means glee? Max, did you also have any existential ennui about this episode? Because I did. Anyway, (laughs) we'll get to our theories. So our first theory comes from Garrett on Twitter at Garrett CRW. He said, my theory is I think we're getting at least one more redo of The Good Place because Michael has to do something super rude to Vicky, aka real Eleanor, aka Denise. So like he's got to do something just because he really doesn't like her. So he's got to make her be like a garbage picker or something. Yeah. So we've got to get like a three beat where like Denise is the... The greatest. Is the pizza chick okay. in this episode. And then next episode, she's going to have an even worse job. And then the next episode, she's going to have an even worse job. So we've already had the first beat in season one. Oh, so okay. Maybe we're just Denise, getting one more. Pizza okay. Denise is, is the second. Two. Gotcha. And then the third beat will be like... She's a garbage picker. Or something. Yeah. More okay. creative. She's a plumber. Yeah. Plumeress. Mm. Clog wench. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. I have heard some theories that Vicky is going to be the one who actually takes Michael down. Oh, I would like that. Or that she joins the core four because she's sick of Michael not treating her like the Ferrari that she is. Okay. Which is interesting. Kind of working against him. That could happen. I think she would want his job. Ooh, yeah. Going against him. Above him. Ratting on Michael to Sean. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we had another question slash theory from a listener named Christian at Captain Chris 01 on Twitter with two Ks. He said, do you think it's possible that Janet could be the key to getting out of the bad place since she was stolen from the good place? That's really interesting, Christian. It's I believe she's going to play a big role in this season. Oh, yeah. Probably much bigger than we realize. I think so, too. I think Janet has got a few tricks up her sleeve. Mm hmm. I wonder if they're going to be able to find out some sort of protocol that actually allows them to communicate with the good place. That would be interesting because we've we know there's a megaphone. Because I wonder if the good place is even aware that Michael has created a neighborhood posing as the good place. I think it would be great to see ambassadors from the good place when they find out what Michael has done to come and either try to take back Janet or to figure out what the heck's going on. Yeah, he said he stole her, so they're probably looking for that, Janet. Yeah. They could have an actual Good Place neighborhood in chaos because they don't have a Janet. (gasps) That would be so interesting. Oh, I want to see that. Or there's just like a shelf full of Janets and one's missing. Okay, that's a little sadder. (laughs) (laughs) But probably more likely. Yeah, it would be interesting if instead of getting the Bad Place people in this season to get the Good Place people. Like investigators who've come down to make things right. Yeah. Although our core four do technically, by virtue of, yeah, of the point system, belong in hell, the good place could have some real problems with the bad place posing as heaven. Right. So. I hope we see something involving the actual real good place or even maybe a bit more of the medium place. Be interesting to see the good place, Michael. And the good place, Sean. And the good place version of Trevor. And yeah. his henchmen. Yeah, the angels instead yeah, of the demons. Yeah, like super preppy 
fancy pants angel looking people. They'd have to be actually legitimately good people, though. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Because we technically haven't seen a good person on this show. No, we haven't seen anybody. <laughs> yeah. Janet's the only one from an actual good place. And, and she's, she's not a, robot. a person. Right. Well, she's not a human. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. We haven't seen a good person on this show yet. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have any last thoughts before we move on to our spoiler zone? Oh, wait. We don't have a spoiler zone. I know. It's so sad. I don't like this. <laughs> any last thoughts about the episode? No, I think I've said pretty much everything. I'm just really looking forward to being surprised in a couple days when the new episode airs. Yes. Today is Tuesday. Yeah, by the way, guys, it doesn't air on Wednesdays. For some reason, the premiere did, but now it is airing at 8.30, 7.30 Central on Thursdays on yes. NBC. And so, we'll be releasing on Wednesdays. Yes. So we'll release the episode a little bit before the new one. Give you time to listen before you go to bed. Yeah. And also give time for people to actually watch the episode. Not everybody's watching it live, so. Right. Okay. And if you have a Nielsen box, then watch it live. Or we will find you. Yeah. We Let them will. know you're watching The Good Place. Like, we will find you. Mm -hmm. We will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and on that creepy note, that'll bring us to the end of Forking Bullshit, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and a review on iTunes because it's the best way for others to find the show. If you want to talk to people about this show, if you want to talk to us about our thoughts about this show and what we talk about... You can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and use the hashtag FBullshirt, or you can find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can always send us an email. Zoom it over to us from our website, multiverseradio.ca. And we will see you next week for our review of Season 2, Episode 3, Dance Dance Resolution. Ooh. DDR! Sounds fun. Yep. I hope Jason is amazing at it. I hope Janet dances her pants off. <gasps> <laughs> she doesn't even wear pants alright bye guys bye yeah and they're definitely gonna have people who clear your driveway for you in the good place yeah I don't think maybe any... not this good place <laughs> I don't think there's any cars oh uh, well you still gotta get outside maybe there's not that much snow right just not that much or snow. you can just walk right through it with no effort oh mm. man that'd be nice or you walk right on top of it no big ooh right yeah you're like Jesus but snow I was thinking more like Legolas, like the elves. Oh. Well, you know, walking on water, but Whatever, it's both fictional water. characters. <laughs> Woo, harsh. That's a Bible burn. <laughs> <laughs> Biblical burn. <laughs> All he ever knew in his old life was twisted. And now we got to do talking, so it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's, that's my that's good redneck sounding voice yeah i like yeah. it